Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Good morning. It's great to see all your bright and shiny faces. And I'm so thankful, so thankful to be here this morning, and so thankful that for all that God's doing in our lives and in our hearts. And so, um, let's pray real quick. So, Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you that, that you're here with us, and we thank you for your peace, and we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you that you're always faithful and always true, and, and your word never changes. You are so faithful to it. So, Father, this morning, as, as we gather here, we thank you that, that you're just opening our hearts and opening our minds so that we can hear what you have to say for to us and in us and for us, Father, and that you just do a great work in our hearts and our lives this morning. I pray for for so many needs out there, Father. I know there's so many people that are going through so much, and and Father, I just pray that you lift them up and you provide for them and you heal them and you make a way where there seems to be no way. And for those who who are selling and it's going good, Father, I just pray that you continue to bless them. And we just thank you for that. Holy Spirit, just speak through me this morning in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. So. Man, I'm all over the place this morning. I was sitting in my home office. Like, I had my wife redone my office, you know. <laughs> Our office is her office, too. It was like, my office is she uses it more than I do, you know. And so I was just sitting there looking, and, like, where my desk is now, like, I can see outside. And so I had to take a picture of it. And I was like, wow, you know. Do you ever, like, look and see, like, at all that God's done? And all that God's doing, and you're like, how in the world did I get here? Like, how in the world did this happen? Where, you know, like, there's a time in our life where we were struggling so much, and it looked so hard, and it was so tough. And then the next thing you know, you wake up, and you're looking out your office, and you're like, wow, God, you just blow me away with your goodness and your grace. But you know something? God was just as good to me when I was in those struggling times. He was just as faithful to me when I was in those hard times. And so sometimes it's hard for us to see that, right? And But it's true. And so I'm just thankful that he's given me the opportunity to grow. And so, and that's the main thing is like in those hard times we get to grow and then in the good times we get to grow too. And sometimes in the good times it's hard too, right? And so, because we're, we're, this earth ain't perfect, right? But we're not in here to be perfect. I was like, one of my mentors was talking, I like, I love to listen to him, and I try to, try to keep my mind focused on what God's saying and on what God's doing and what's going on around the world. It, because one of the things he talks about is how we don't want to be a thermometer, right? Do you guys understand what that means? So, so like, it, a thermometer tells you it, what's the degrees outside, but what we want to be is we want to be a thermostat, right? Where we set, the Bible says that we're the salt of the earth, that God created us for times like these, for hard times, for, for rough times, and, and, and for good times too, right? But God created us to be different. There's a difference about us. There's a difference about how we talk and how we walk and how we do things. And, and you can watch that, um, like, even through the Olympics, right? You see, some of those guys, like, like I got the privilege, I got to walk around, uh, I got to work with um, one of my mentors as a five-time world champion and four-time reserve world champion cutting horse trainer. And, like, I got to spend time with them. And, man, they walk different, bud. I mean, they walk different. They talk different. There's a swagger Around, I used to have a shirt that said, said, said "Powered by Swag," and and, it, and to me, they're like, "What does swag mean?" And I, I, I said, "Saved with amazing grace," right? But but they had a swag about them. They had like like when they walked, 
he knew he was a champion. When, when his kids and grandkids went into the, to the ring, they knew they were champions. They knew they had a history. They knew they, they had a legacy. They knew that it was in their blood. It was in their DNA. And so when they'd ride into that ring, they'd win, right? And they walk different. They talk different. And when you're around it, you couldn't help but be different, right? You couldn't help but walk different and talk different. You're like, hey, I'm with them boys. You know, and you walk through there, you know, it's got like, you got to get your shoulders right. See? Like this. Yeah. And so but there's a swag about it. And that's what God's created us to be. He's like, you're not common. You're not ordinary. God created you different and to do great exploits in his name, right? When you walk, you walk different. When you talk, you talk different. When we really know who we are and whose we are, it changes our entire life. And when it changes our entire life, it changes everyone around us, right? So now we're, we're, we're not, we don't care what the Seahawks score is, right? We don't care what, what the weatherman's saying. We're not focused on all that stuff. Like we're not sitting there being a, a, thermo, a thermometer going up and down, but we're setting the atmosphere. We're saying, do you know something? You're created for something great. God's created you for something spectacular. And you know what? You're so valuable that he died for you. God's not mad at you. He loves you. Even those people. Come here. You're out there. You're like, man, I'm going to watch this because I don't know why. Well, this is your good day, right? Your blessed day because you get, I'm going to talk right to you. So God's not mad at you. God doesn't hate you. Maybe you're going through, through a rotten time and maybe you're messing up all over the place. But guess what? That's why he died for you. Because he loves you and because he's for you. And he's that good. We can set that atmosphere. We can be thermostats, right? Set it right at 70. Like, but the problem is, it's like thermostats are different. Right? Like when you go and read the temperature, like if it's 90 degrees outside, it's 90 degrees outside, right? Right? If it's 70 degrees, it's 70 degrees. But like when you set the th thermostat, like I set it, like I, I used to like it at a certain thing, but my wife liked it at something else, right? And I was like, good Lord, like it'd be freezing, right? And she'd want the covers. Or it would be hot, right? And she'd like, like, like be covering up, you know, and like it was just always the opposite of what I was needing or wanting. And I'm like, good Lord, how are we going to work this out, right? And so when in doubt, the wife's always right, <laughs> right? So anyway, that's why God created, you know, when God created man, like, like he, he's like, okay, I'm going to create man. And so I think it was an experiment. <laughs> right? He's like, let's see how this can go. And right, so he makes man and he goes, eh, that's all right. That's man. And so then he creates woman and he's like, let's try one more time. And so he creates woman and he goes, whoa, man. <laughs> right? And so that's why women are so, so much better than us guys, right? I mean, I mean, they're smarter. Some guys argue with me on that. They're way better looking. <laughs> Right. And no guy will argue with me on that. Right. And so there's great value. Right. That God created us to set to set the stage. Like, I don't I, I don't want to follow the world in its ways. I want to set the, the stage and follow what God wants in my life. Right. The world's not going to determine my relationship with God. And the world's not going to determine my walk with God. That's between me and him and me and him alone. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? And don't ever let anyone put anything like that on you, right? It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. And so last week we were talking about King Solomon, right? And he had just become king, right? And so I want to go back and I want to review this because God was showing me a few more things through this, and it's a difference between religion and relationship, right? It's a, di a difference between tradition 
which is a therm is, is like a thermometer, right? Or or a relationship which is a thermostat, right? And so here here we're going and, and um King King David had passed away and you're like, Man, he's gonna preach this message again. You know what? If I have to preach the same message over for six weeks, I'll do it if that's what the Holy Spirit tells me to do, right? But this is going to be a little bit different, so you guys can breathe a little bit easier, right? But here, King, King David had died, and Solomon, man, he's next in line, right? You ever get so blessed, and something so big happens, and then you get put right in the middle of it, and you're like, I've been praying for this, I've been believing for this, and now I've got it. And then when the reality hits, you're like, oh my goodness, I got it. Now what do I do? Right? Am I the only one that's ever felt like that? And and so so we got blessed with with um, with a whole herd of horses, and God's blessed us so much. And then then it's like just getting the reality of it, and walking through, and seeing what God's blessed me with, and getting to know Him. And then I, it sinks in. Oh yeah, <laughs> look what God did. What do I do now? Right? And so that's what. It's happened to me a lot of times. It's like maybe right after you get married, like you think you know everything about marriage, and then about 10 or 15 seconds into it, you realize like there's a big difference between your a man and a woman, right? Bet- between me and her, right? And so, anyway, sometimes we don't know what to do. Sometimes we don't know how to do it. And so, we can either like try to just kind of feel through it ourselves, or we can find a mentor to help us through a lot of stuff. That's what one of the things that I've been able to do in my life is if I don't know what to do, I find someone who knows what to do and is succeeding at it, right? Like now when I go to learn to train horses, I didn't go go to Bubba down the street that get buck, gets bucked off every time he steps on the horse, right? I found the best I could find and I went and I listened and I I gleaned everything I could from them, and that's where I started getting some swag, right? Because you can get the swag, but if you go down and you get with the wrong person, you can get the the mully mully grubs, too, is what they say down south, man. And you can get your confidence broke. And then when you get your confidence broke, then it's like it doesn't matter where you walk into a show at, you're going to get your tail kicked, right? Because you're not right here right? There's something about it. But we have this great counselor, right, that lives inside us. His name's it's the Holy Spirit, right? We have this great book we can go to when we don't, when we have a question and we don't know what to do. We have a living relationship with the creator of the universe. And when we don't know what to do, we can go to him and say, hey, what do I do? And he say, just trust me. Man, that's one of the key things that I've learned is like so much of the time we think we got to see everything. Like I got to know the exact path. You got to tell me exactly where to step and exactly how to do it. And we don't know, right? We don't know. So God's like, you know something? You just step. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. He's a light into our path, right? He's like, he's like a flashlight. That's what he's saying. It's like, here, here's the way. Walk in it. Follow me. And so, like, the way's not regulations and it's not rules, but it's a person and his name's Yeshua. His name's Jesus. It's a personal relationship. It's not rules and regulations, but he's like, follow me. He's like, this is, like, you want to know who the greatest champion of all is? We see him through the pages, like not just in the New Testament, but through the pages of the Torah and the writings and the prophets. Then we see him in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and all the way to Revelation, man. We have a revelation of the champion of champions and the king of kings all through this book. You want to know how to walk? Look at him. Get connected with him. The Bible says, as he is, so are we. In this world, he says, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We have his authority. We have have his peace. We have his hope. We have everything. And it comes through one person and his name's Jesus. He's a champion of champions. So if we need to know what way to go, he's like, the Bible says he's the way. 
right? He's the truth in his life. That actually goes back to the temple. Whereas you're going into the courts, it's, it's the way. And then it co- you come into the truth, and then you find life, right? But he's the way. It also comes to the, to the um, body, soul, and spirit. You know, we're, we're, we're not... But like we're not who I who we say we are. We're like we have our name. Like my name's James Mays, right? Those are just two words that my mom and dad gave me, right? That's not who I am. Like like I what you look at. I know it's pretty, and I love living in this in this house, right? I mean, I was so blessed, right? But this isn't me either. I am a spirit who has a soul who lives in a body. These bodies, they pass away, but our spirit and our soul will live forever. There's more to us than what we see, right? You look and you want to leave a lasting legacy. Look, Abraham Lincoln, right? George Washington, you look at these and you hear these names and you're like, well, well, they're gone, right? They used to live. No, they're not. George Washington was a great believer. He was a man of God. He's not gone. The name George Washington is stuck on a cemetery somewhere, but he's alive and well in heaven. He's going to live forever, and so are you, and so is everyone you know. Because we're not ordinary. We're not what we see. There's more to you than what's in your body. There's more to you than what's in your name. You are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. You have royalty flowing through your veins. You're not ordinary in any way, shape, or form. And that's good news, right? So here Solomon, man, he needs wisdom. Man, I need wisdom all the time. I think I'm smart, but I'm not always. I always tell people that that Linda's the brains and I'm the beauty. And everybody laughs like that, too. <laughs> like, I'm almost going to hurt my feelings if I didn't have swag. I already know who I am, right? Right? But so Solomon's coming, and he, and he starts off, and it says, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord, in the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Okay, now, we can read through Scripture and we can get so so far into Scripture that, like, sometimes we, like when I read, I read for breath. Do you know what that means? Not for breath. Like, but for, I shouldn't breathe like that. I should go like this, right? But for breath right i study for depth you hear what i'm saying so when you read the bible read through and you can get some breath and god will breathe into you You get some breath and you can get some breath in it too but as you're reading through the bible you get some breath and you get some stuff going in and sometimes we get to reading and we go 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 so fast that we forget that we can go diving man like, in some, some of us are just like skimming, or we got the rebreather, or, or scuba gear, and God's like, man, you can go hard hat with this, bud. <laughs> like, I'm your lifeline, I'm your hope, and get way down. And so, but sometimes we miss some of the subtleties. And this is one of the subtleties that I've seen in here that I really, the Holy Spirit really put on my heart because I think so much of the time we miss this. But it says this the people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Okay, now so there's something going on here because like if you go to Israel today, guess what? There's no temple, right? Guess when the temple was destroyed, guess what? The, The sacrifice became no more, right? Why did the sacrifice become no more? Because it's in the Torah, right? It's in the Levitical and uh, um, statutes and regulations in the Word of God. You do not sacrifice unless there's a temple, right? Unless there's a tent of meeting, right? When, when the children of Israel were going through the desert, get, what, what did they have? They had, they had the tabernacle in the wilderness, right? And then they'd, they'd sacrifice on the Ark of the, 
of the covenant, right? So, but these, these people, like, it's not that they didn't love God. Have you ever done the right, the right thing with the wrong motivation? Like, I've done it a lot, right? Most of us, most of us married guys have done that a lot, <laughs> right? Most of us in life have done that a lot. Sometimes we can do the right thing, but it's in the wrong motivation and it's in the wrong place, right? It's with the right heart, but it's still the wrong thing. See, they were still missing it because under the law, if you're not perfect, if you miss one little spot of it, you're guilty of all of it. You know what that means? None of us got a chance. And Jesus brought it to a place where he said, if you even think about it, you're guilty. Now, who's got a chance at that? We're sunk, man, if it comes down to who we are and what we do. And so what the people were doing is they were going to these high places and they said, you know something, we don't have the temple, but man, I know I'm messed up and I love God and so I want to sacrifice to Him. So they were doing, they had the right, they, they wanted to sacrifice to God. They wanted to offer stuff to God, but they didn't do it through, through what God provided. They did it through their own works. They did it through their own ways. How many of us do that? And I think this is the difference between religion and relationship because now, today, we still do that. Like We're like, if you do it, don't click this box and that box and this box and that box, then, then guess what? You're not right. And that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. Do you hear what I'm saying? When Jesus died, He died for all. One and for all. He was the original three musketeer. Right? Every one of us. We don't have to click any religious boxes. It's not about rituals and regulations, but it's about a relationship. And when you get to the place where you think you have to earn it, you're sunk. Not that you're going to go to hell, but you're sunk because you're going to put yourself through hell trying to get right when you're already right, when you've accepted the blood of Jesus over your life. Right? It wears out. It makes us tired and sick and, and so many other things. And so here, it was their culture. It was, what, it was a popular thing to do. There's a lot of popular things to do, but just because they're popular don't mean it's right. Right? It was the popular thing to do. So here, Saul, it, it goes on and says this. And it highlighted it. The people were sacrificing at the high places. They were going to a place that they thought was high. Why were they going to that? They went to the highest place they could find. Why? Because they were trying to get as close to God as they could. If you're trying to please God by your works and by earning it, never going to do it. It's only by His grace and His perfect sacrifice. Right? But there's hope for us. Right? Because all we got to do is say, Father, I receive it. I'll trade you. I'll give you all this stuff and you can have... And I'll take all your good stuff. And that's good news, right? So here the people, however, were sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David. I love David. Like you're saying, well, what is some of David's statutes? I'll, let me read a little bit of his heart, man. Psalm, this, this is a psalm of David. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the Lord God of Jacob protect you. That's Psalms 20, by the way. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept all your offerings. All your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and may all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and we will lift up our banners in the name of the Lord. May the Lord... Grant all your requests. Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed. He answers Him from His holy heaven 
with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O Lord, save the king. Answer us when we call. See, Solomon grew up with David, right? He grew up with a man who, who like, like, like Saul had killed his thousands, but David had killed his ten thousands, man. This is the giant killer, right? This is the shepherd boy who God anointed and God called and he went out and he killed a giant. This was the dude who was perfect and never messed up, right? No. He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. He was an idolaterer in a lot of ways too. He messed up so much. But when he messed up, he didn't rely on what he could do. He went to God and said, Hey, I ain't got nothing to offer you. I just need you. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. This was his example. This is who he grew up with. And now they're talking about the statutes of David. And David's statutes in his life come to a place where he was dependent in relationship with God. He was perfect in no way. He could never even be elected to be a pastor, let alone president or king. Probably couldn't even get elected dog catcher. Because they'd look back at what he'd done. But God looked at his heart. And so now here's Solomon. Solomon who grew up with this man who knew, who watched him pray and watched him handle stuff. And he's still going to God like, I don't know how to handle this, but I'm going to walk according to how my father walked. And as he's walking, it says, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. Well, what is a high place? He did what everybody else was doing. He's like, it said he loved the Lord. He done everything perfect except. Only problem is, is we all got that except. We all have that thing, that, that hang up. I'm telling you, we, we got habits and hang ups. All of us do. Right? And Solomon was no different than we are. Right? But he's like, you know something? I'm going to follow the crowd and I'm going to do what they're doing. And I'm going to be popular, do the popular thing and go to the high places. So it says that he done the wrong thing, but he had the right heart intention. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices for what was the most important high place, the most popular high place. It wasn't important to God. It was important to people. That's why we got to be real careful. That's the difference between religion and relationship. Just because it's the, the popular thing to do doesn't mean it's the God thing to do. And it says that Solomon, the king went to Gibeon, the highest place you could get, to offer sacrifices for, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. So here he is, he's offering these sacrifices. And God's mad now, right? Solomon, you messed up, buddy. <laughs> Guess what? You can't be king no more, right? I, I, like, you didn't just, just sacrifice one lamb. Like, you brought a thousand of them. Like, how, you, you messed up. Your heart's right, was right, but, but your action was wrong. And so, guess what? You can't be king no more. He was mad, right? No. Do you know what it says next? It says, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Time out. That's not fair. Like, what about all those other people, right? That, that messed up just a little bit. What about the priests when they were bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant back that, that touched the Ark wrong and dropped dead just for touching the Ark? What, what about about Aaron's sons who were killed because they brought strange fire? What about all these other things that had happened under the law? Where people just made a little bitty mistake and then they were killed or something bad happened. What about them? 
That's not fair, is it? There's a difference here in Solomon. And it's a difference. And Solomon was going to God with his heart. He wasn't leaning on, on regulation. And he wasn't leaning in the flesh. Right? We can try to do stuff in our own works to make ourselves good enough for God. And, and it will kill us every time. Right? Maybe not physically, but spiritually. Or in our hearts. Right? So, so here, he's messed up. And God says, ask me for whatever you want. I mean, come on. What kind of God is that? I think people are like, I don't read the Old Testament because they're all mean in there. God's nasty. It's like, man, this looks like a really rough God to me. Right? And Solomon answered him. And you know what? God, he asked for, we covered this last week. He asked, what he was asking for was small, a hearing heart, right? Discernment and wisdom. How, how, how to operate wisdom is how to operate in this earth, which we need because we're here in this earth, right? And discernment's knowing in our heart what to do, right? Discerning. How, which way to walk and how, how to do it, right? And so God said, okay, I'll give you that, but I'm going to give you riches and honor and long life and all these other things. But I love what happens when all this is over. And he, he, God ends it here. He says, moreover, I'll give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and command as David, your father, did, which he really sucked at it, right? He stunk. So it had to be in God's grace, right? Now watch this. Father did, I will give you a long life. God's not looking on the outside. He's looking on the inside because that's the real you. You have greatness in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside you. But it says this, And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes as your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke, and he realized he had been a dream. And then he says this, He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark, of the Lord's covenant and sacrifice, burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. Now listen to this. He returned to Jerusalem and he stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant. See, before he was going to the popular, popular place, before he was going to the high place, trying to get high enough for God, what happened in the Tower of Babylon? They're like, We'll make them, we'll go up to God. And God says, man, you can't do that. Right? For he's trying to do everything in his own strength and in his own ways. And some of us get in those, those things too. Because like I grew up in a really religious um, kind of mindset. And I ran from it when I realized that I couldn't keep all that stuff. I had no hope. Until I found Jesus. And when I found Jesus, He changed my life. Because He says, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Me. You can't earn what I'm giving you. It is only by My grace and only by My goodness. And it comes through covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, that's something we need to cover. Because it had a lot to it, right? But what was the Ark of the Covenant? That's where the priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood of the Lamb. And it was representative of Jesus also. So he went from trying to earn it on his own to now he's relying on covenant. And he's remembering his covenant. And God changed his heart. I want to challenge us, man, because I can still get in that. Right? Well, i got to earn this or i got to earn that. God, if I just do this, will you do this for me? Am I the only one that does that? Oh, thank God. Whew. we got a church full of honest people. No liars here, right? But I don't want to be like that. 
I want to be fully dependent on the grace and the goodness of God. It's like in my own self, I'm not good enough. I can't keep it up. I mean, God created me holy and great, but like, I don't have the ability to be perfect on my own. But in Him, I have forgiveness and I have a relationship. And because of that, He sees me as perfect and nothing less. Isn't that good news? Amen. Amen. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your, for your blood. Thank you for your covenant. Thank you for dying for us. And give us the wisdom like Solomon had to know that, that we only stand because of you and your grace and your sacrifice. If you're out there and you don't know Jesus, it's simple. All we, all we say is the Bible says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you're saved. So, Father, forgive me of my sins. I receive you. I believe in you. Come into my heart. Thank you. In Jesus' name. If you said that prayer, let us know. We'd love to pray with you. And um, anyway, we will see you down the road. Not down the road here. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.com dot o r g